am going to read a bio to do it full justice because I forgot after that an announcement to, uh, to introduce our uh, speaker properly at the last talk. Um, so now, by now, you know Professor Tapper, and he's at Cambridge. Uh, before that, he was at um, CRNS Paris and the University of Durham and Imperial College in London. Uh, you already know, actually, he's the founder of two startup companies because uh, he talked about that and the inventor of an anti counterfeiting technology. He now has over 60 patents granted and is a frequently invited speaker at international conferences. The winner of the GSK Westminster Medal and Prize, which you saw, that picture, 100,000 pounds. Sounds good. And uh, the Degusa Science to Business Award and the Hermes International Technology Award. Right. And the Institute of Physics uh, Patterson Medal and Prize, and he's also a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and I just want to make sure that I spelled that all out because sometimes we're here comfortable with you guys and you don't realize you have a <coughs> star in our bed. <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much, Beth. And uh, it's a great pleasure to give the final talk of this, this wonderful school. So uh, this is the, the fourth distinguished lecture. And so this, like the other three, is currently touring, touring the world. Um, and I'd like to talk about perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And actually with a, with a really interesting overlap with some of the things that Beth talked about before, um, I'm going to talk about how uh, potentially we can use perpendicular magnetic anisotropy uh, for a range of applications from uh, ultra-low power spintronics right through to cancer therapy. So here's what I've got. So I've got a very brief introduction to the physics of nanomagnetism and perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. I'm then going to talk about green computing, i.e. trying to do computing while dissipating the smallest amount of energy possible, and just give you some ideas as to how uh, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy can help us to do that. And I'm going to cover a range of of ideas, some things that are very much real world and are already being used in product, right through to some crazy things that uh, are ideas from my lab that um, almost certainly won't happen, but it's, it's really interesting to think about them and to, to work out uh, what's useful. Um, and then finally, I want to switch gears from IT into biotech and nanomedicine and talk and show you some work we've been doing uh, in collaboration with the University of Chicago uh, on killing cancer cells using synthetic antiferromagnets with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. Okay, so this is my take on the world of nanomagnetism. Um, for the last 20 years or so, nanotechnology has been meeting magnetic materials, and that meeting has had various forms. Uh, from the chemist's point of view, it's all about chemical synthesis of tiny little nanoparticles out of solution. Uh, from people from a physical vapor background, it's more about depositing really thin films on a silicon substrate and controlling the interfaces between those with near atomic precision. And then for people from the semiconductor background, it's been about using the, uh, the, the lithographic techniques of the microchip world in order to break up these sorts of films laterally as well into structures that are defined by, by lithography. So these are true nanostructures in as much as they are they are nano-engineered in the Z direction, and they're also nano-engineered in the, in the X and Y directions. Now, although these are lots of uh, different types of material, um, there's one really simple and very old piece of physics which will get you halfway towards understanding the physics that drives the behavior of these things. And it's a very, very old classical idea called the ellipsoidal demagnetizing tensor. And all you do is you imagine the structure the film, whatever it is you're interested in, you imagine it's a generalized ellipsoid and you assume it's uniformly magnetized and when the magnetization meets the surface, there is a divergence in that magnetization, that acts as a source of magnetic field which comes back inside the structure and opposes the magnetization that generated it. We call that the demagnetizing field. And you can, you can calculate the demagnetizing field using a very simple expression where you just um, take the magnetization of the particle and you act a tensor on it called the demagnetizing tensor. And that tensor really describes the shape of the structure. So NX, NY, and NZ tell you something about how that ellipsoid is stretched in those three directions. Now, the physics is all in the signs of these equations. And I do promise you, as the last talk of the evening, these are the only two equations I'm going to show you tonight. But substitute that demagnetizing field into this energy equation, 
you'll see the minus signs cancel. And so, very simply, you end up with the result that the, the presence of a demagnetizing field increases the energy density. And as we know, nature acts in a way to minimize energy density. So we would expect to be able to understand at least halfway uh, the, the physics of all of these different nanostructures just by looking at what is it the magnetization can do in order to minimize its demagnetizing field, because that's what will give it minimum energy. So let's take one specific case of an infinite thin film. So in that case, the demagnetizing tensor is, is very simple. It's 0, 0, 4 pi. And let's just try magnetizing that film in each of x, y, and z and see what happens to our demagnetizing field and our energy. So let's start with magnetizing it along the x-axis. And in that case, you activate this element in the tensor. That gives you zero demagnetizing field. And so that's a nice low energy state. So we'd expect uh, a film to be quite happy to be magnetized along its x-axis. Let's rotate that in the plane to be magnetized along the y-axis now. We activate this element in the tensor. Similarly, zero. Therefore, this should be a very low energy state and therefore very happy. Now, finally, let's try and pull the magnetization out of the plane so that it's along the z-axis. And in this case, we activate this maximum value of 4 pi here. We have the highest possible demagnetizing field, and therefore, this is a very high energy situation. So, without knowing anything else, we would say an infinite thin magnetic film should always be magnetized in its plane, and we should never see a film that's magnetized out of its plane. Okay? Now, everything else I'm going to tell you in the rest of this lecture is about materials that behave like this. And the reason I've taken you through this is I want you to be surprised. I want you to understand that if you see a film magnetized along its z-axis, there must be something going on of enormously high energy. Because whatever's going on to cause that, it's got to overcome this maximum 4 pi ms demagnetizing field. So it must be a powerful effect. And we call this uh, dependence of energy on the magnetization direction shape anisotropy. And I'll refer to that term again in a, in a few minutes. So what are these materials that, that have this strange tendency to magnetize along the, the z-axis? Well, there are different types, but the, the, the ones that I want to focus on tonight are those with what we call interfacial anisotropy. So typically it's where you have a very thin layer of a magnetic material in contact with either another type of magnetic material or a non-magnetic material. So the classic example, and this is a cross-section you see here, this is, the classic example is the cobalt-platinum system. The symmetry breaking that you get at the cobalt-platinum interface leads to the generation of an anisotropy, which has its easy axis this way, along the Z direction. And I would say there are, there are three characteristics of this uh, so-called perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So, first of all, it's very large in magnitude. It's a very powerful effect. Secondly, it opposes the shape anisotropy. So it's, it's easy that way, so it tries to pull the magnetization out of plane, and indeed it succeeds. But then the most subtle, and actually the most important point, is that quite often these PMA materials have a very strong Brown's paradox. Now, Brown's paradox is where the coercivity of a material is much lower simple stone of Wolfhard model would tell you that at the easy axis, the coercivity is roughly equal to the anisotropy. And in most materials, that's true to within a factor of two. Brown's paradox materials are those where the coercivity can be orders of magnitude smaller than the anisotropy. And that's often the case with these PMAs. And if you think about it, that's a really special situation. The fact that you've got a very large magnitude anisotropy means that the magnetization must be either spin up or spin down. It's, a ver it's too high an energy for it to be anything in between. And so it's intrinsically a Boolean system. But having said that, it's very easy to make the transition from up to down. So it's a switchable Boolean system. And that's really interesting for applications. Being Boolean, it's intrinsically binary, so it's a great way to, to represent and to store information. But having a really low coercivity makes it very easy to change that information, to manipulate it, to process it. So already we should be thinking about what useful things can we do in the digital world with these sorts of, of materials. So let's have a look at some real stuff. So this one is uh, one of my favorites. This is cobalt iron boron, and it's got platinum on either side. And it's very thin. The, it's only 0.6 of a nanometer thick. And you see the hysteresis loop here, nice square loop, full remnants, 
and then sharp transition at a relatively low field, just two or three hundred ersteds. And we can actually go into this loop and we can see what happens as you go down and up those coercive transitions. How does it switch from a spin up to a spin down state? So we can take our Kerr effect magnetometer, uh, provided to you by Durham Magneto Optics Limited, of course, <laughs> and uh, we can look down from the top, we can see through the top platinum layer, and we can do what we call 3D looping, where at each data point in the loop, there is a corresponding underlying domain image. So we can really see what makes up this loop. And if we look down the coercive transition, what you actually see is the, the brown is the top there, so that's uh, spin up, and then the white is where it's going to, which is here, which is spin down. And as you go down that coercive transition, this tiny little white domain in the middle nucleates and then grows and expands to cover the whole of the sample. <coughs> you have these beautiful, circular, smooth domain walls that are very characteristic of this, this particular material. So, one of the first places that these materials are being used is in MRAM. So, magnetic random access memory. Uh, we have high hopes as a high-speed, high-density uh, non-volatile memory for, for computing. And it's, there are currently two generations on the market. The, the first generation stores the data in a little three-layer structure. So you've got a, a free magnetic layer at the top. Uh, you then have a tunnel barrier, and then you have a fixed magnetic layer. Data is read out by looking at the magnetic resistance across that tri layer. And data is written by generating local magnetic fields. So you pass short current pulses through uh, copper vias in the chip, and just the Ersted field around that current switches the magnetization in the free, in the free layer. And that's already on the market. Uh, Everspin have brought that to market, and it's being used quite widely in niche applications. They're only low density at, at the moment. In the second generation, which is uh, just about emerging onto the market, uh, it's the same three layer structure, the same readout. But now the writing mechanism no longer involves classical magnetic fields. Instead, we used a spin polarized current, the spin torque transfer, and uh, this makes it an all electrical device, which is a, is a really important step towards making these things scale to, to smaller sizes. But there is still a problem in this second generation of, of MRAM. Let me explain what the problem is. So the way we, we think about the data storage process in thermodynamic terms is that you have two energy wells separated by an energy barrier. And one of the wells corresponds to spin right, which is in this case a zero, and the other energy well corresponds to spin left, which is a one. So the writing process, converting a zero to a one, involves taking the state of the system, raising it over the energy barrier, and then into the other well. So that barrier is really um, gonna cost you work. You're gonna have to supply energy in order to change the data state of the system. And that, it adds up. Although it's only a tiny amount for a given cell, you've got billions of these things, and ultimately you end up dissipating a lot of energy um, because of this, this barrier. But on the other hand, this barrier is also really important because remember, it's a thermodynamic system at finite temperature. And so, in fact, the, the state of the system is doing this. It's, it's fluctuating thermally. It's got KT, thermal energy. And we have to make sure that as it bounces around in its potential well, there's no chance that it's going to jump over the top by thermal activation within a reasonable time scale, say, say 10 years. So this barrier is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because it causes you to do work to get hot when writing data. It's a blessing because it keeps your data safe once you've actually written it. Now, if we look at second generation MRAM, you can actually decompose that barrier into two components. There's one component which increases writing energy and stability. And there's not much we can do about that. Those two things go together, and we want to have them both, so it's got to be there. But then there's another component which actually only increases the writing energy. It doesn't, cost, it doesn't give you any extra stability, but it does cost you work and makes the device less green. So, enter PMA. What the engineers are doing is to introduce a very small amount of PMA at the interface here. Not enough to actually rotate the magnetization out of plane but just enough to compensate some of the Z demagnetizing field, and that allows that unwanted part of the barrier to be shrunk away. So we can engineer the device to only have good barrier, barrier that contributes to stability as well as to, to writing energy. And that's happening as we, as we speak. 
In a third generation of MRAM, which is, is on its way but isn't here yet, the strength of this PMA will be turned up so that the magnetization turns out of plane. And just as the hard disk world has made the transition from storing data in plane to out of plane, so will, will MRAM. And now, this takes advantage of the first of those benefits or those features of PMA, i.e. its enormous strength. Um, if you use that anisotropy, the PMA anisotropy, as your main storage barrier, its magnitude is so strong that you can afford to shrink the lateral dimensions of the device down to a very small size without losing thermal stability. The total magnetic energy of the barrier remains high, even though you've only got a very small volume of magnetic material. And that's then the enabler for gigabit density memories that hopefully will move MRAM from being a niche product to being a mainstream product in every one of our laptops and smartphones and, and so on. So that's all real-world application of PMA. Nothing I've said there is too, too outrageous. Let's get a little bit more outrageous. And let's start to think more fundamentally. Why is it that we can only store one bit of data in a memory cell? This is typically what today's cells are like. So there's a certain footprint, so many F squared. And within that, you get one free layer, and therefore you store one, one bit of data. What's stopping us, in terms of fundamental physics that we know, from transforming a memory device to something like this? where instead of having just one storage cell, you have eight, and therefore you can store an entire word rather than just a, a bit. Or if we can do eight, then why not 80 or 800 and increase the total volumic density of our memory without actually having to get any better at lithography. So leaving aside the, the difficulties of fabricating a, a structure like that, let's just look at what bit of physics would we need in order to make something like that possible. And one of the things that you realize quite quickly is there's an essential need for a shift register. We need some physics phenomenon that when we apply a stimulus to this device, every magnetization layer copies its data state onto its neighboring layer in a synchronous fashion. Because if you can do that, you can use the fact that the magnetoresistive readout is very localized and only really takes into account the top layer. And so under the shift command, however we're going to do that, we want all the data to move up and we can then read out uh, at the top of the cell the word bit by bit. Now, engineers have been making shift registers for years. There's nothing special there. Um, but the way they do it is with hundreds of transistors. And normally, they make them laterally. So they shift data sideways between lots of CMOS blocks. This is a slightly different scale problem. Each of these layers might just be one nanometer thick, and it's vertical. So there isn't space to put all the transistors in here that we would normally use in order to, do, to make shift register action. What we want is a fundamental bit of physics that allows us at a physical level to achieve the digital function of shift registering. And that's what we've uh, been working on in recent years, how to get shift register action out of basic physics phenomena. And here's the scheme that we've come up with. And it's, it's quite fun, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy seeing it. So it's a two-step recipe in order to make a physical shift register. So the first thing you have to do is to take your stack of free layers and you have to alternate their thicknesses. So you have to have a thin one and a thick one, thin one then a thick one. Now, the alternation may not be that great. I'm talking about 0.7 nanometers compared to 0.8 nanometers. So uh, just a, an angstrom between them. But nevertheless, it has, to be, it has to be there. Now, they have to be coupled as well. If we want the data state of one to be copied into the neighbor, we need some energetic coupling between ne uh, nearest neighbor layers. And RKKY coupling across the ruthenium spacer is the most convenient way to do that. And the trick is you need to alternate the strength of that coupling as well. So in this drawing, you still see the different thickness of the blue magnetic layers. We now also need strong coupling, which are the cream layers, and weak coupling, which are the brown layers. So we're going to go thin, thick, thin, thick, strong, weak, strong, weak, or J1, J2, T1, T2. And those of you with a materials background will notice that the, this structure here breaks inversion symmetry. I could turn this thing upside down, and you would know that I'd, that I'd done so. That's an important way to understanding how you get physical shift registering out of that. So before we look in any more detail at the, how that works, let's just look briefly at the materials. Um, I'd like to just show off the, the wonderful structures that the material scientists we work with can, can make. So these are all made by splatter deposition. This is not a trivial thing to make. There's a lot of optimization has to go into getting this right. 
but we have eight three layers here. Um, the thin ones are 0.7 nanometers, the thick ones are 0.8 nanometers. Um, each one is coupled with ruthenium, but we need a bit of platinum there as well, just to keep the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy alive, and we can use that as a variable attenuator of the RKKY coupling. So you'll notice that the cream ones have got half, of, half a nanometer of platinum, whereas the brown ones have got a couple of angstroms more. And that just gives you a slightly weaker coupling across there than you do <coughs> across there. And then in addition to these eight uh, data storing layers, we've got three um, sort of experimental test layers at the bottom, which are there really just to help us uh, inject data in the first place, just so we can, um, we can test things in the, in the lab without having to make a full <coughs> device. If we were to flip from material science back into double E, this is the functional description. And what we're actually doing here is we're making a master-slave flip-flop. So the way a digital engineer would shift data is by doing it in two steps, on the f in a master-slave configuration. So on the first half cycle of a clock, you move the data into the first half, the master, and then on the second half of the clock, you move it into the second half, which is the slave. And so it goes click, clack, and that's... That's a very good way of separating an input from an output and for getting a unidirectional data flow. Because these layers are all in contact with each other, it's as if we've made four master-slave flip-flops and then we've connected them directly together. We've connected the Q output into the D input of the next stage and they're all piled up on, on top of each other. Just to flip back to material science, that's the, the actual device. So even though we've got uh, four master slaves and the transition injector. The whole thing is only 20 nanometers thick. And you can just about see the different layers in that cross-sectional TEM. And as a reminder, that's an overlay of the functional description. So they're the four master slaves, and that's the data injector at the, at the bottom. Okay, so let's actually uh, try and run one of these things and see if we can shift data through it. So it's a really simple experiment. Um, we don't pattern in X or Y, so it's only, this device is only one bit wide, but it is 8 bits high, um, and we can use a really nice experimentalist trick. If you remember that the two magnetic layers in the master and the slave, T1 and T2, are slightly different thickness, that means that as data propagates through the device, there's actually a very slight change in moment, which we can track in a vibrating sample magnetometer. So all we have to do is take one of these chips, square centimeter, put it into a VSM, and apply a clock magnetic field to it and just measure the moment in the VSM as we go. That's, that's all we have to do. And so I'm plotting here the, the applied field. It's really a square wave field, but I've put these little plateaus in at zero just so we can pause and see what's happening there, because actually we learn an awful lot by seeing what's happening at remnants. And this is real experimental data at room temperature um, of the moment of the whole sample. And I've interpreted the data for you in this cartoon here, just so you can quickly keep track of, of what's going on. Now, here's the subtlety of, of the coding scheme. The, the ruthenium couples the layers anti-parallel. So the default ground state of this is up, down, up, down, up, down. And the way we signal data is by a phase break in that anti-parallel ordering. So we go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up. And it's, that's the phase break. And that is our data bit. It's like a flux transition on a hard drive, if you like. And this is the thing that we want to propagate synchronously through the, through the stack. So let's do it. Let's, uh, let's ramp up our field. We start in this condition. The transition injector is doing its job and creating a boundary condition that guarantees a data bit between layers three and four. And we uh, ramp up the applied field and we see the moment jumps up. That corresponds to layer number four switching from down to up, i.e. the data bit has moved one layer. And then as the field retraces back towards zero, you see the moment falls again, and that corresponds to layer 5 switching, and we've gone through one cycle of click, clack. The data bit is now two layers higher than where we started. Just as a little aside, you'll notice the moment, although it has fallen, it's come back to a level slightly higher than where we started from, and that's because of this T1, T2 difference. In moving the data bit from there to there, we've taken this from a down to an up, and that from an up to a down. But because T1 and T2 aren't the same, going from there to there actually gives you a slight change in moment. And that's exactly what you're, what you're seeing here. And we can correlate that quantitatively with the thickness of the, of the layers.
Then on the negative field cycle, nothing happens. And we're now into the second cycle. And again, you see a rise in the moment, click, and then a fall, clack. And then nothing happens. And then on the third cycle, a rise, click, and then a fall, clack. And then it's quiet for half a cycle. And then finally, on the fourth cycle, remember there are only four stages, four master slaves in this structure. There's a rise, click, and then a fall, clack. And at this point, the data bit has been shifted out the end of the shift register, and it's now, in principle, empty. And this is why I want you to believe me that this is the correct interpretation of what's otherwise just a VSM trace. We don't tell the system that anything has happened now. We don't say, OK, that's the end of the experiment. We just keep on cycling the field, but you notice that the VSM stops responding. It knows there were only four stages there, and that the shift register is now empty, there's nothing else left to move, and so uh, the trace goes, goes quiet. And that's how we really know that it's come to the end of the, the shift register. Now, there are two types of data bits. There's a one and a zero, if you like, or a, there's a down-down, a and there's also an up-up, and we can, we can shift both. Uh, so you've seen these data already, and this is what you get for the other type of data bit. And now the moments go down, and there's a general fall as the bit climbs. So the bit's still going up but the moments go in the other direction. That's, that's what you would expect. So, so what, you think this will be more efficient than the race track? <laughs> 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 that is a lecture in itself. Um, all I would say is this is intrinsically synchronous. So race track is asynchronous. It relies so on all those walls moving together. And if that doesn't happen, then it's a um, Putting it into a synchronous master slate guarantees the impossibility of collisions of data. Um, it's also, you're now, I mean, effectively, this is like a domain wall of a, sh of a, of a racetrack, but it's in a discrete medium. Uh, and this is actually, a, it's, a kink, it's a topological kink soliton. Um, so, yeah, there are similarities in concept, but I think there are some practical differences to do with the synchronous nature, which make it quite interesting. So where is this going? What are we going to do with it? Well, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's a really fun bit of physics. Um, I think there are some, some technical problems to be overcome before you really could make a three-dimensional um, MRAM out of that. But using the principle of being able to engineer switching fields and interactions in order to create a synchronous shift register, got us thinking about the sorts of structures that Beth was talking about, these very long anodic alumina pores. And we've seen already that chemists know how to make structures that are 100 microns high and only a few tens of nanometers wide. And up till now, we've, we've never really known how to make use of that full aspect ratio. Because if we tried to fill it with data bits, we'd still have to bring contacts in from the side, which is actually quite complicated. Knowing now how to be able to shift data remotely in a synchronous fashion from one end of a pipeline to another opens up the possibility of truly three-dimensional type storage devices. And so there's a, a European consortium at the moment looking at the materials of uh, anodic alumina and things like that, where we electro-deposit alternating materials. You can see the change in color there as we go from one type of material to another, and trying to make these three-dimensional shift registers to shift data throughout a whole volume of material for ultra-high density solid state storage. OK, that's all I want to say about green computing. Let me just switch gear for the next 10 minutes to biotech. And let me just quickly recap something that um, Tim talked about extensively this morning and which, which uh, Beth touched upon, and that's uh, hypothermia as a treatment for cancer. So this is what a cancer cell looks like to a physicist. It's uh, just an ill-defined cloud blob. I know the stuff in there, but I don't really know how it works. Um, what I do know is that uh, there's a lot of interest in getting magnetic nanoparticles inside those unwanted cancer cells and then doing various things in order to try to cause trouble. So one of the things that people do is to apply uh, a radio frequency oscillating field. You go around the hysteresis loop of the particle. The particle gets hot, and in getting hot, it either burns the cell or it triggers uh, some other chemotherapy drug. So that's one approach. Now, that's not what we're doing, and I'm not going to talk any more about hypothermia. There are plenty of other people who are doing beautiful work on, on that. Instead, I'm going to talk about a different scheme, which Beth also touched on, uh, called mechanical disruption. So it's the same starting point. You've got magnetic nanoparticles inside a cell. But now, instead of applying an RF field, you apply a much slower field, maybe just a few hertz, uh, but much stronger, maybe a Tesla or so. And under those conditions, you don't go around the hysteresis loop of the particle. Rather, the particle goes around you. 
and so the particle actually spins and becomes a little nano chainsaw and exerts hopefully very strong torques on the inside of the cell or to the outside of the cell um, which either does physical damage directly, just rips the cell membrane or it opens up calcium ion channels, it stresses the cell uh, which triggers an apoptosis mechanism and the cell commits suicide. That's the, that's the strategy. And the way to think of this is there's a chemotherapy where you can turn the toxicity of the chemo drug on and off by remote control. Chemotherapy is great if it only kills cancer cells. The trouble is it's toxic to everything else it meets. What we'd really like is to have something that remains benign until it's safely in the cancer cells. Then with a flick, a flick of a switch externally, we can make it become toxic and start to kill the cells that it's meant to kill. That's the, that's the big picture idea. Now, from a magnetic point of view, let's just stop and think. What would the ideal magnetic particle be for doing this? Um, up till now, most people have used iron oxide or, or something like that. But is that really the optimum material? And we just uh, decided to try to sketch out the hysteresis loop that we would like in an ideal world of a particle to use for mechanical disruption. And this is what we came up with. So the, the features of this are that it's got zero remnants and zero susceptibility. And that's really important in order to stop them from agglomerating. These are little dipoles and they're free to move in solution. We don't want them attracting each other and forming a big, a big lump. So having zero, moment, zero remnants and zero susceptibility does that for us. But then once we've decided to apply a field in order to generate a torque, we want to be able to get as much moment back uh, as possible. So we get the strongest possible torque. So we want the loop to come along flat here and then suddenly go up to the highest possible value. So we need to get a high moment induced under preferably just a moderate applied magnetic field. And then finally, and most importantly, it's one thing to generate a torque on a spin. That's just M cross B. That's easy. The harder bit is to generate a torque on a physical particle. So we must have a mechanism for transferring the torque from the spin into the actual particle. Otherwise, we'll just have magnetization going around in a circle, and the particle itself will stay still. Now, clearly, anisotropy is, is going to be that mechanism, but there are subtleties to this. And so I'm just going, at this stage, to just mark the loop uh, as having open branches here, just to remind us we've got to sort out the anisotropy uh, to make sure we have a strong transfer of torque from the spin system into the particle system. Now, if we compare that to the superparamagnetic iron oxide that most people use, it's not great. Um, okay, you have zero remnants, so that's good, but you've got quite a high susceptibility, which under certain circumstances can lead to agglomeration. Um, more worryingly, once you apply a field, you don't actually get that much moment. The MS of iron oxide is very low, and the particles are very dispersed. So you don't get as much torque on the spin system as you would like. But then, worst of all, there's no anisotropy. There's, not, there's no form of correct anisotropy to convert the spin torque into a particle torque. And so although people going right back into the, early, the late 20th century have been trying to do mechanical disruption and have seen some results, it's very patchy. It's, there's no clear effect. And we think it's because the superparamagnetic particle just lacks the right anisotropy to link the spin torque to the particle torque. So let's look at some of the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy materials. So here's just uh, a real experimental loop from a two-layer part of the shift register device that I've already shown you. So we've got two cobalt iron boron layers with platinum to keep them perpendicular, with a bit of ruthenium to couple them anti-parallel. And this is, what, this is a real experimental room temperature hysteresis loop from that sort of material. And the reason now that you have zero remnants and zero susceptibility is not because the superparamagnetism is jiggling the spins around to zero, but it's rather you've got half the particle points down and half the particle points up, and so they, they're equal and opposite, and so they fully compensate. And that's what gives you the anti-agglomeration property. Once you apply a moderate field, you flip that bottom layer, and now they become parallel, and so you recreate the full moment of the particle, good strong moment. And if you remember my opening slide, remember this anisotropy is huge, so that means that any torque generated on the spins immediately gets tr transferred into the particle. So we've got the three requirements of <coughs> zero remnants and zero susceptibility, a strong moment, and full transfer of torque into the particle. So in principle, a material system like this has the potential to form the ideal particle for mechanical disruption of, of cells. <coughs>
Now let's just check that. Let's just run a little model. So here we've got a particle. The pink arrow is the moment on the particle, and the green arrow is an externally applied magnetic field. And we're going to rotate that field, and we're going to model exactly what will happen to the, the spin on the particle. And the way we've set up this simulation, we've got the particle suspended by elastic torsions, such that if there's a torque on the particle itself, we should see the particle begin to rock. So that's the sign to look for. If it can rock, it can do damage to anything, any cell that it's, it's in. So let's run the, the simulation. Um, and you see the moment pretty much follows the applied field. It, it, it jumps over the hard plane, but you'd expect that just from sort of all far. But most importantly, the particle itself has got a good old rock, and that shows that we're getting a strong, strong torque on the particle itself. So this is the, uh, the real stuff. This is the layer system that we've, we've made. Um, it's, again, a big, large multi-layer, so we've got plenty of, of uh, moment in there, but each repeat unit is a 0.9 nanometer of cobalt iron boron coupled with ruthenium. Um, and then there's a little trick where we, every other coupler, we make tantalum, but that's a technical detail we can talk about later if you, if you want. Now, I can see you're confused, though, because uh, a few moments ago I showed you these sorts of structures for microchips. Um, what, how are we going to get a microchip inside a cancer cell? So let me introduce you to a new, a new class of magnetic material, the synthetic magnetic liquid. And it's very simple. So we know about spintronics. We know how we've all been using uh, physical vapor deposited multilayers to make little types of integrated circuits for, for many years. And we get highly tailorable magnetic properties in each of these elements. We also know about magnetic liquids. Tim showed you a whole load this morning. There are ferrofluids, the magnetorheological fluids, all sorts of things that typically have got iron oxide nanoparticles with some st stabilizing molecules around them to form a, um, a, a solution or a suspension. Let's let this world meet that world. Put an aluminium release layer underneath each nanostructure, dissolve it in alkali so that each of your little memory cells lifts off the wafer and forms a liquid suspension so that it would look a bit like this. That's what we're calling a synthetic magnetic liquid. So the layer structure is defined by physical vapor deposition. Every particle in the suspension is drawn by electron beam lithography, but we then make a liquid out of this. Gives us the ability to uh, do liquid-based experiments like cancer treatment and things like that, but we get the full tailorability and ability to engineer the magnetic properties that we get from physical vapor deposition. So we can use perpendicular anisotropy, RKKY coupling, synthetic antiferromagnets, all of these wonderful uh, materials, tricks that we've developed in the last 20 years. So here's the, what they really look like. So in this case, we've made a synthetic magnetic liquid, and then we've dropped it back onto a wafer and let it dry and looked at it under a microscope. And these little ravioli that you see, these are the, the little packets of multi-layers. And you can see they, they're just lying randomly next to each other. They're not all agglomerated into big chains or lumps. So we, we can see that the, uh, the compensation strategy is working. And then we can check that we've really still got the advanced magnetic properties in each of these that we, we thought we had, that we set out to have. So we can measure the hysteresis loop um, of the continuous film before we pattern it. And you see there we've got the zero remnant, zero susceptibility uh, in the middle, just as we, just as we want. And then we can just go and hunt around our wafer, having processed them and then dropped them back down again. And we can look for a particle that just happens to be by itself. And we can take the laser spot of our uh, nanomoak magnetometer and we can put it directly on top of that single particle and we can get a hysteresis loop from one single microstructure. And with a bit of noise, you see um, we get exactly the same thing as we had before we processed it. So this is great news. It means we can go through many sequences of lithography steps, lift off of the solution, dry out again, and we can still retain the nice magnetic properties that we, that we wanted to. So let's try using them. Let's put them into some cancer cells. So we're using the same cancer cells that Tim talked about earlier today. These are human glioma cells, and they're responsible for the glioblastoma brain cancer. And uh, this is the outline of one of the, the cells. And you can see edge on here uh, four of the magnetic microdisks. And all we've done is we've incubated the cell with some particles around it. And the, the cells either suck the particles in or it's grown around the particle. We're not quite sure which. Um, but it seems pretty straightforward to internalize these uh, particles into the, the mass of the, of the cell. 
This is how we're going to apply the torque. So remember, unlike hypothermia, we want a good strong field, about a Tesla, but it doesn't have to be too fast. So we use a permanent Holbach magnet array, which gives you about a Tesla across a one inch gap in the middle. And we put it on a rotary bearing, connected to a DC motor, and we just spin the thing. And we spin that at about 20 revolutions per second. So we can have a 20 hertz, one Tesla rotating field with enough space in the middle to either put a Petri dish for in vitro studies or to get a mouse, a mouse's head for doing uh, in vivo studies, assuming it's a brain, a brain tumor. So let me just show you some of the in vitro uh, results. So this is a relatively simple uh, experiment. All we do is we uh, incubate the particles with the human glioma cells, and then we apply the magnetic field, the rotating magnetic field, for just a minute or two. And we also do a control where we put the particles in but we don't actually apply any magnetic fields because we want to be sure it really is the torque of the, on the particles that's doing the damage and not just chemical toxicity or um, a steric effect of having a big foreign body inside the, the cells. And we use a stain called Trypan Blue, which stains blue any areas where there are damaged cell membranes. And you can see, um, let's look at this, this image here, you can see the outline of the, of the cells, the black dots are the micro discs, and you can see the blue stain uh, lighting up around each cell. And if we quantify that, if we just count within the field of view of the microscope the number of cells that are stained blue, you find that after two minutes of exposure to magnetic field, about 80% of the cells are showing signs of damaged cell membranes. If you don't apply the rotating field, then only a few percent <coughs> do. So it's a very powerful effect, and it's a very rapid effect. Most of the other people who've done mechanical disruption studies needed several hours of exposure to a field to see anything significant. Uh, in just two minutes, we're seeing an 80% effect. So it's clearly a very powerful uh, torque that's, that's being generated. We can look at a slightly different type of stain. We can look at something called 7AAD, which looks for um, DNA sequences that have been spilled out of the cell. So we're seeing nuclear material being spilled out of the cell because of, of damage. And it's a fluorescence technique. So here's the fluorescence images. These are the structural images. And we can overlay the fluorescence on top of the structure. And if we look down here, you can see the outline of the cancer cells. You can see the black micro discs. And then you see these red fluorescence markers um, lighting up, showing that the cells that have the particles in, in the presence of 30 seconds of magnetic field, are leaking DNA. So we are definitely doing something bad to these, to these cells. And likewise, if you, don't, if you have disks in there, but you don't apply a magnetic field, you see the cells, you see the particles, but there's no red fluorescence. So you don't see any 7AAD stain. There's no DNA leaking out of those cells. So finally, what about moving to in vivo? It's one thing to kill cells in a Petri dish. What about helping uh, some animal with cancer to get better? Um, so we've studied cohorts of mice that have been given a tumor and the tumor is allowed to grow to a, a mature size and then at the moment we're doing very simple experiments where we just physically inject with a hypodermic syringe the particles directly into the tumor. The tumor is about a millimeter in size at this point so with a, a microscope and a steady hand you can just about um, get a needle in there and inject some particles. We only do that once, but then every day for the rest of the life of the animals, we give them 20 minutes of exposure to the magnetic field. That's about the threshold at which they begin to get stressed, and so we don't, we don't want to stress them uh, any more than we have to. And then we, we measure how long they live for, and at the end of their lives, we, 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 we um, do post-mortem post analysis, we do histology, we section their brain, we section <coughs> the liver, the testes, um, all the different organs, and check where the particles have got to. And this is uh, a really nice example of what you see in the brain itself. So there's the outline of the, of the tumor, the one millimeter tumor. And you see the, the black areas here. These are where we've managed to get particles into the tumor. And in this case, we're doing what's called tunnel staining, which shows a, a browny red stain when, there's, uh, when there are fragments of DNA associated with cell apoptosis, so programmed cell death. And what's really interesting is if you look in this area where you've got high density of particles, you see in between all the different disks, you see the, the brown stain showing up. 
say, which indicate that those uh, cells have, have undergone ap apoptotic uh, death. So this is very encouraging because it means we are actually killing uh, tumor cells in, in a real tumor in a, in a real animal. The thing that's not encouraging and why we're not shouting slightly more loudly about this at the moment is that the mice themselves don't actually show any change in survival time. They don't live any longer. They don't live any less, which is a start, <laughs> but they don't live any longer. <laughs> and that's really surprising because we are definitely killing cancer cells here. Um, and we think you can see the problem actually in this, this image that um, because of the very simple distribution pro uh, method, uh, administration method of just using a hypodermic, we're only getting the particles into about 20% of the whole tumour. Most of the tumour doesn't actually have any particles in it. And wh while we may well be killing the tumour in these regions, the remaining 80% of the tumour then goes on to kill the animal just as quickly as the original tumour would have done so. So the focus on the work now is to try and improve the distribution of the particles throughout the tumour to see if we can actually make a real difference, the thing that counts, the survival of the, of, of the animal. Okay, my time has gone. Let me uh, conclude. So perpendicular magnetic anisotropy brings these new amazing levels of functionality to magnetic nanostructures. Um, and it's really the, the, the secret source is a combination of high anisotropy with low switching fields. And that gives you a, a very stable, low energy uh, digital light device for, for structures. It's a real world thing. Second generation MRAM currently on the market already uses PMA in order to make it more green. Uh, third, generation, uh, we're third generation MRAM using much stronger PMA and being fully perpendicular will be here soon. And that'll be the enabling step towards very high densities. We've demonstrated a, a vertical shift register which copies magnetic data from one ultra thin layer to another and we're trying to build the materials at the moment to convert that into a uh, a high density three dimensional data storage concept and we've demonstrated cancer cell killing both in vitro and in vivo using synthetic antiferromagnets in this synthetic magnetic liquid uh, formulation again based on based on PMP. Let me acknowledge all the good folk who've, who've done this work particularly our friends over at the Brain Tumor Center in University of Chicago Hospital and also in Shanghai and let me thank you for your attention. Uh, so you have shown that uh, these particles in uh, in magnetic fluid have dim planar dimensions like two micrometers and are yeah. much thinner. Yeah. How do you manage to do that? How do you get rid of some substrate on which you deposit samples? So you, you put a release layer. So before you put the magnetic stack, you put aluminium as, as the very bottom layer, and aluminium can be dissolved in alkali. So in the, you then do the full lithography. So it's a, as if you're making spintronic devices. But then as a final step, you put an alkali, you, you dissolve that bottom aluminium, and the rest then floats off. I should say the, the two micron size is a little bit larger than we would like. We did that really just to have an easy life with lithography uh, for a first attempt. Um, probably 200 nanometers is a better size for these, and that's what we're working on at the moment. So. Yeah. So, thank you. Very, very nice talk. Uh, so just one uh, question, uh, maybe just uh, for discussion. So you, you talk about the brown uh, uh, paradigm, right? And that talk about uh, anisotropy versus switching field, right? So for this perpendicular case, you show the micro disk. That may be still maybe following that category. But uh, for real memory or logic application, and then dimension must go to single domain region, you know, like uh, sub 20 nanometer, you want to need sub 10 nanometer as we talked. And then that switching field and the cosivity, uh, anisotropy and cosivity should be following the same line. So may not be as uh, uh, we talked about here, ground, you know. That's quite right. And so we've, um, we've done a few tests where we begin to structure things down laterally in the memory device. So we've gone from five centimeters down to about 200 nanometers. Um, we can get good data down to about two microns because that's the smallest size single particle that we can really probe. Um, and you certainly see an upward uh, drift in all the switching fields as you shrink down. But everything moves together. So the operating window 
just shifts, but you still have the same operating margin. Beneath a couple of microns, we, we don't have good data as to what happens there, because it's quite difficult to probe in a simple type of device. As long um, as you have a multi-domain, that could be OK, right? But well, uh, it's a single domain at remanence. It's only, it's, I think it's important to distinguish multi-domain at remanence from a system that uses a domain wall as a switching mechanism. But I think we know from MRAM that actually surprisingly small things, you know, maybe 100 nanometers in a perpendicular, because the wall is so narrow, still involve a domain wall for switching. Um, we, we've done some modeling on device type performance, and we, we used the data from um, uh, IBM, because uh, they, they published an APL a few years ago looking at, I think, 20 nanometer diameter perpendicular uh, layers. And so we've used their value of coercivity um, to put into our model. So we've, we've got a pretty good feel for what life looks like at, the, at least down to 20 nanometers. Okay. Let's not do Randy because he's faculty. Let's, let's, let's come back to him. So, yeah. so I'm just kind of curious. We've seen a lot of uh, biomagnetics today. Yeah. Has there been any sort of a search for materials that are either resorbable or degradable? You know, something that the body right. can handle afterwards? Sure. Um, so the question is what the, the fate of materials in the body? Because we're all, today, you've seen all of us stuffing different things into cell type things. Um, I'm not a biologist, so I'm, I can't speak too authoritatively about this. Um, the two things I think we have to look at are what, what the macrophage do, because the macrophage are the, are the body's garbage collectors. Um, and so in an ideal world, after um, cell destruction, the macrophage would come and eat up any particles that are left and take them out through the lymph system. That, that would be the nice thing to happen. What we don't want to happen is the particles to remain embedded in the body to act as then nucleation sites for future tumours. Um, the other thing we have to look at is the total volume of material and compare that to the LD50 number for that type of material. And in many of these applications, we're still only using micrograms of material. Um, there's not actually that much stuff there. But um, we've done a little bit of, of basic toxicology. So we've um, injected particles into healthy mice and, again, then done histology on all the other organs after they've been sacrificed. And we, we don't find the particles anywhere else. They don't leave the brain. Um, and we don't see any decrease in survival of the healthy mice, of the wild type, uh, with the particles in them. So we're, we're not poisoning them outright. We know that. But that's a very small answer to a very big question where there's a lot more work to be done in the future. What is the speed associated with the domain wall motion in the now, when you say domain wall, do you mean the lateral domain wall or do you mean the data bit going vertically? The uh, in these materials, those walls move at about um, 100 meters per second, usually. Depends on the field you apply. The, uh, you can basically get any, field, any, any speed you want over many orders of magnitude, depending on how close to the coercivity you go. But um, 100 meters per second would be a good take home number. And what do you think is causing the nucleation? Well, that's a defect. You can see it actually. If you, if you look really closely at the screen, you can see a tiny little nick in the sample at that point. There's a tiny little scratch or a bit of dust or something there. Um, yeah, it's usually some sort of defect that, that does it. At what frequency can you run your shift register? So uh, what I showed you there with the, car the cartoon was very slow because it was in a VSM. So we've got magnet coils this big. Um, we've done a magneto-optical version of that where it's much faster. Um, and we used uh, 50 microsecond field pulses to do the shift, and then we, we waited a longer time to actually make the measurement because we don't have enough bandwidth to resolve a 50 microsecond shift. But we can see if, if the shifting pulse is only applied for 50 microseconds, does that result in proper shifting? And it, and it, it did. And there was virtually no difference between that and the, the quasi-static version. Um, we'd expect it to be able to go to tens of nanoseconds without seeing anything too different. The effect of coercivity of the material would increase. And you have to take that into account. But you shouldn't see true sort of gyromagnetic effects until you get beneath about 10 nanoseconds. Can you explain the process of magnetization switch for the PMA? Say why there's a, a dot in the center and the perfect circle rolls up uh, to the edge. So the dot's in the center because I chose it to be in the center. <laughs> I used my microscope to hunt around for the nucleation sites and then took the movie with that in the middle. So there's nothing magic about the center of the sample, um, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, and that would be related to some sort of defect. Um, 
The, the reason the domain walls go out in a smooth, circular fashion and they're so, the, the walls themselves are so smooth is largely because of the boron. So the, the boron breaks the crystal structure and makes the cobalt iron boron amorphous. And that stops a lot of the pinning mechanisms that you'd normally get at crystalline defects from doing anything. So if you compare those sort of domain images to what you'd get in cobalt iron, perpendicular cobalt iron, where the wall is much more jaggedy and it's, it's, it's much bigger steps. Randy, do you have a question? Yeah. I was going to comment on what uh, John Payne said before, which is that the thing about those cobalt platinum is that they actually switch in a very different way than normal because the cobalt layers switch layer by layer and owing to thermal fluctuations at sharp corners or defect or whatever. And so therefore you end up with the fact that even if it's like a 30 nanometer uh, sample, you still have this problem that you get domain wall nucleation across the side of it, and you actually have to get the size down very small before that quits, so 10 nanometers. So it's almost a two-dimensional material. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. So Absolutely. Very, very abnormal. And, 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 and wonderful. Go <laughs> <laughs> uh, on. Um, so can you have a single domain uh, ground state for your uh, 3D SAF structure? I mean, do you have to constantly apply these fields to maintain these, uh, you know, alternating bits? Or, uh, no, no, no. That, that's why the supposed square wave of clock field actually goes by a zero at those plateaus, just so you can be sure what is happening at remnants. So at remnants, everything's perfectly stable. Um, the anti-parallel RKKY coupling makes the up-down, up-down state very happy. And then wherever you have a frustration, um, the system is not energetically that happy, but it doesn't have any choices. So it is, it's everything stable at, at zero field. Uh, yeah. but could you, uh, in that case, could you have a pattern of like complete zeros or complete ones uh, stable at ground state? Well, remember, it's like a hard drive. So uh, that's not, uh, I, I guess when you say all zeros or all ones, what you, re what you really mean is all, yeah. everything aligned together. That's not what that would be. Everything aligned together is actually, is a, is a data bit every layer. So like a flux transition every bit on a hard drive, and you, you mustn't allow that. There's a minimum spacing you can have between flux transitions. So there's a minimum vertical density of data that's less than the, the density of, of layers. Shankling? So uh, have you tried to use uh, current to drive this uh, uh, shift register? So we haven't, largely because um, it's a lot of work to pattern those things into nanopillars, which we would need to do. Um, our expectation is that that would also uh, shift in the same way because the, the way we've designed the interactions between the layers, there's one layer is much easier to switch than all the others. That's how the shift register works. As to whether you then do that switching with a field or with a current doesn't change too much. Of course, with a current, it's already got a unidirectionality to it, which a field doesn't. Um, and that gives you other options. Uh, and particularly, it gives you the possibility, at least in theory, of making something that can shift both up and down. Whereas what I've shown here can only ever go, can only ever go up. I think with the 3D uh, anodic alumina structures, we are, we're doing those experiments at the moment. We are, we're putting current across them and trying to shift bits like, like that. Well, for current, maybe there is, could be potential concerns about the refraction. Uh, you have majority spin and there is spin. So if you think about the spin diffusion lines, yeah. uh, there could be some, uh, uh, some, some, some bad effect on the I agree, the current, yeah. I agree entirely, so that, absolutely. That, that part you should pay attention to. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Sure, absolutely, help us ask. Yes. With the uh, cancer killing stacks, you said you were defining them by e-beam. Um, well, actually, but that was optical, but we will be defining them by e-beam, yeah. Uh, you're right, I did say e-beam, that was a mistake. Um, does that limit the cost-effectiveness of the timing? That's a really interesting question. So um, we have encountered the same problem that Beth talked about. Um, we have a different solution. You might be interested in this, Beth. Um, it depends in, on very specific details of the way the e-beam machine is engineered. And we compared three brands of e-beam machine, and two of them came up with the 23-year version, and one of them came up with the long weekend version. So we, we, have, we have actually been able to write 10 to the 8 structures across a weekend, um, 200 nanometers. Um, the, sorry, you asked something else, the... Um, the cost of the time effectiveness. Yeah, so the cost of time effectiveness. I've done a back of envelope calculation, just with my businessman's hat on, to say if I really had to build a business manufacturing these, what would it cost to make? 
And I, I come up with a number of 10 to the minus 7 uh, dollars per particle. So uh, we find in the cancer treatment that a, a therapeutic dose for a mouse is a few times 10 to the 7. So it's a few dollars worth of material. Clearly, there will be some applications. We did a back of envelope calculation a few weeks ago where we uh, worked out what would it take to put one of those particles into every blood every red blood cell in the human body and that's about a million years of fabrication time and the entire GDP of the universe to fabricate so that's not going to happen <laughs> so w you're right though you have to look at, uh, at the cost and the number of the, the time to fabricate the particles for a given a given application yeah. oh. um, in radio beam therapy of cancer cells there's sometimes this bystander effect seen where the, the cells that are hit directly start uh, the apoptosis phenomenon and then nearby cells also uh, start to show apoptosis it's thought it's through some <coughs> cell signaling pathway but i don't think the principles of that are fully understood so i wondered whether you had seen any evidence for that in your images because you can clearly see which cells have uh, the particles in and which don't. Yes. And I wonder if there was any evidence there. Um, I mean, certainly you can see on the images, there are definitely brown spots in places that don't have black discs within the tumour. Having said that, it's a section, so who knows what we cut out in going through that section. There may be a particle just on the other side. Um, there's a very strong correlation between the brown stain and where you have the most particles. I certainly couldn't rule out outliers where you're getting stained without particles, but I, wouldn't, I don't know what, what statistical significance to put on them. That's the, that's the problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs>